Hello, everyone. Welcome to Real Guitar Success Live. I'm Thomas. For those of you who are new today, we've got questions to answer about playing guitar, which is one of my favorite things to do. I have pre-submitted questions. I'll start there. Please add questions in the chat. If you're watching this now and you're um, feel free to add clarifying questions. If you could start with the word question, it'd really help me out. Um, I have a lot of comments and it's hard for me to sort the questions from the comments when I'm looking. So let's start with the first question. In my 10 secrets, this is from Dan, in my 10 secrets to guitar playing, number six is learn chord patterns versus individual chords. Could you explain in detail what this means? Are you talking about the cage system or something different? Um, so number six is learn chord patterns instead of co individual chords. I noticed a lot of students when I was teaching guitar at my music school uh, full time would see how many chords they could learn. And it was a little bit of a badge of, I know, 27 chords. Um, but they couldn't turn those into anything that really sounded like music. What I mean by chord patterns is, first of all, the idea is instead of just learning individual chords and seeing how many you can learn, learn a few chords and learn them well enough to be able to change from one to the other. That makes it useful. Then put those into patterns that are common. So for an example, I'll go to my guitar right now. Here's a common chord pattern. Oops, sorry. I, I think most of us would recognize that as a, a common sound. It's a common chord pattern or chord progression is another way to say that. There are when you listen to songs, I used to think every song was a unique beast. But in reality, since my years of writing my own music, I realized that you can't really write something that's too different from what people are already used to, or they can't access it. It doesn't make sense in their heads, and they won't enjoy it. Most songs are built off of maybe two hands worth of common chord patterns. That was one of them. Um, in music language, we use the terms one, six, four, five. It's just talking about the number of that chord in relationship to the scale. If you number each of the notes in a scale and you make a chord out of each of those notes, you could say the first note is the one chord, a chord built on that first note. The second note, build a chord, that's the two chord, and so on. And it's, it's helpful to know this. But even more helpful is to just practice common chord patterns, patterns that are used a lot in music. So rather than spend a bunch of time learning individual chords that don't relate to each other, pick patterns that make sense in your ear, that is common, and preferably, you know, the kinds of music that you listen to, and learn the chords in that pattern and then put them together. Get good at changing from one to the other and then move on to the next pattern. Hopefully it'll use maybe a different chord, then learn that chord, put that in that pattern, and practice that and move on. Much more efficient than just practicing random chords or playing random songs without realizing the patterns. It's much more efficient to look at the song and say, hey, I know that pattern right there. Two thirds of that song is just using that pattern. I'll just work on these other parts of the song and put it all together, it's much faster than treating each song at one bar at a time and keep going through the song. It's easier to memorize it, it's easier to learn it, and of course as you collect these patterns, more and more becomes available to you. So that's what I meant. Not anything to do with the cage system, um, uh, though that's a whole other subject. Uh, Bauer asked, uh, I'm doing the uh, some add nine and add eleven chords. My third when I'm doing the add nine and eleven chords, my third finger creates a buzz on the second and third string. Uh, what is a good exercise to flatten out my third finger? Now I've since come to understand that what Bauer is asking about a specific exercise in real guitar success in the monthly practice sessions that uses uh, some eleventh chords. 
um, I just want to mention until I did this, created this exercise and had uh, somebody transcribe it, I never knew what the name of those chords were. Uh, it never mattered to me. I, here's the chords that I'm talking about. I'll do it with a pick. So those are the chords in the exercise. Um, I I hear it more of as a descending bass line over some chords. So this is a B minor chord, and I keep descending the bass line, B minor. But in fact, I found out it, it makes a B at a B minor at eleven. That's because of this high E there. It's not really a part of the B minor. By the way, for those of you, just a little theory tidbit. What add 9 and add 11 mean is that you have a chord and they've added another note to it that is either the 9th or the 11th. So, so in B, that would be a C sharp. It's one step up above B, but add a whole octave and that makes it the 9th. So it's the 2nd, add 7, that makes it the 9th. 11 would be at count up four notes and add seven, that makes it the 11th. The reason it's called add, is because there are rules for creating a, for example, a B minor 11th without the add. It has to have some other notes to be called that, in particular, the seventh of the chord. I won't go into too much detail there. But when it, this chord doesn't have that seventh or the other notes that would make it an actual B minor 11th chord. So by add 11, they're saying you basically took a B minor and just added the 11 note to it without the other rules that would make it uh, a different name. So that's how add nine, add 11, you can, uh, there's add two. Add two and add uh, nine are, are really the same thing. I, I, they are the same thing, it's just people use different terminology. Okay, so with that said, the question is, He's buzzing when he plays some of the notes. And he's asking, Bauer, you're asking to flatten out your third finger. Now, let me go to my guitar again. Um, I'm Bauer, I know you're on the call. Feel free. I would love to hear more from your clarification. I'm not flattening out any third finger. I'm not flattening out any finger. As a matter of fact, it's the opposite that I want to do with this. The trick to not getting buzzing or not getting muted notes it can be the same issue to some degree, is to getting a good angle up and then back down. If you lower your hand like this and it lowers your finger, you're going to start either muting notes that are after the note, but also you're not getting as much pressure on the notes, which creates buzzing. The other thing about buzzing, it's often caused by uh, not getting your finger close enough to the fret. So the trick is, let's take that first finger, no, I'll go third third finger, right there, third finger. Um, it's not as close as I'd like it, but considering I got my, my pinky in there, it's as close as I can get it. That with enough pressure makes, yeah, good clear notes. But if I get a little farther away, listen. I'm getting some ugly sounding notes closer. So it's a matter of pressure too. I can really pressure through it way back here. Yeah, my guitar set up pretty good. So if I press hard enough, but the thing is, I don't want to press hard. I want to press as light as I have to and get a good sounding note. So it's a combination of pressing the right amount, getting it near the fret and getting a good angle so that you get, you don't have to use much muscle to get the pressure to go straight down on the string. So I don't want to flatten it out. If I flatten it out, it's going to touch the, another string and I'm going to get the most pressure closer to the tip of my finger. As I get back here, I have to use more muscle to make it press down. That's the opposite of what I would really want when I'm making these chords. So same with this chord. This one's called an F sharp seven at 11. 
get the angle, get the angle. By the way, this is a great exercise to practice bar chords because it's basically bar chords without a full bar. There's two problems with bar chords, getting this right and then getting this part right. So by practicing this, you can focus on getting this part right to sound clear and to use the least amount of pressure to get the notes. And then you can work on the bar separately and then put the two together to play bar chords. The next question is from Grant. What is your recommendation for developing a... Oh, let's go back to my, my face. <laughs> Looks weird, my guitar talking. What is your recommendation for developing a deficient area of guitar skill? For instance, uh, I want to develop my finger style and I'm working through the daily lessons that come out monthly. He's referring to the daily practice sessions. These are... Uh, weekday in the Real Guitar Success membership. And each day, it's the goal is to spend at least 10 minutes on it just to go through it and decide if you want to spend more time later. You can save it for later and come back to it, or you can uh, spend more time and try to perfect it. But the goal is not to perfect it that first time around. It's just to get exposed to it. And the thing is, each of these practice sessions are a different area of playing guitar. I have finger style, some theory, there's chords, there's some um, solo guitar playing or, or improvisation. And the idea is to keep exposing you to different areas and different techniques constantly. And then you make a decision if that's something you want to spend more time on, practice more. My intention is to give you more than you could actually do at any one time, but then you could save it, narrow it down, and work on what you feel you get the most bang for the buck at any particular time. And of course, you know better than me. I, now, that said, and I said that for a reason, you can do both. The finger style is a progressive step-by-step -step course. So one thing builds on the other. The practice sessions are not. It's meant to give you different things in different areas at different levels to expose you to different things and then to give you the choice to make it this, to work on it more or to come back at it later or to just ignore it after you've played through it. Just know that's available. The thing is, this is how you actually learn to get good at something. Ideally, you know, I, I thought when I first started my lessons that everything was about sequential step by step. But I've come to realize over the years and partly from my own experience of studying a foreign language, I could go step by step till I was blue in the face, but I could not actually communicate in a live situation. You need to be exposed to different levels in different areas and even struggle a little bit to get proficient at a skill like music and language, which are very similar in a lot of ways. Music is a language. So I offer both the step by step, the fingerstyle course, the beginner's guitar journey, uh, is all step by step. One thing builds on the other. You can go back and review at certain times. And in addition, the practice sessions, which throw in different things at different levels, give you a chance to fumble, to feel good because you can do something, come back at something later and see that you've progressed, to be exposed to things that you didn't know even to ask for. And the two work hand in hand together. So, yes, do the finger style, spend a little bit of time on that each day, step by step do the practice session, spend a little time each day, depending on your practice schedule. You know, some people could spend hours, some people 10, 15 minutes is a lot. I know some people, and I've done this at times, I'll work on one thing one day and work on something the next and kind of alternate. Or three days out of a week, I'll work on one area of guitar theory, let's say, and four days out of a week, I'll work on some specific technique. So you can mix it up like that. Ideally, you're going to Work on the, each thing enough to see progress. With the practice sessions, you don't have to complete or perfect anything, but you save what you want to work on, and you might want to just focus on the finger style if that's what you're really into right now. Um, you could save the finger style in your favorites and do the finger style lessons and spend a little time on the finger style lesson that you saved as well to give you some variety. All said and done, I'd still encourage you to do the practice sessions on a regular basis. Try to do them every day. There's only sessions five days a week that gives you two days of catch-up. So on the weekends, you could, if you couldn't get all the sessions done, you could do that. Or you could do the sessions during the week and do the finger style on the weekend or some combination thereof. Um, 
bottom line is you get to decide, but I'm giving you the tools to work with. I don't want to pretend I know everything that's going on exactly your level and in your head. At the same time, I know I need to do things to push you and expose you to different things to give you the choices of what to, what to work on. And the step-by-step -step courses will provide that that structure so that you're not making big leaps and bounds all the time and getting frustrated. But you do need to try and stretch also. Otherwise, uh, it's not likely you'll get really proficient with your instrument. Let's go over now. Those are all the pre-submitted questions. Um, I'm starting from the top and I'm looking for the word question. Mark, question. A while back, you made mention of doing a session about loopers. I am looking forward to this session. Thank you for your vote. And yes, as a matter of fact, the the, the next Real Guitar Live, the real one, that's the first uh, Thursday of February, that's part of what will be included in that. I've been playing with the looper uh, and uh, having a great time with it. The looper is just where you yeah, digitally record your guitar playing and then you press a button and it'll play it back while you can play something else. What I've mostly been doing is playing some chords and practicing my improvisation over it. I have electric guitar and I've been having a great time with that. I have it in another studio so I can't really show it off here, but I put on uh, my plans before the Real Guitar Live on uh, the first Thursday of February to bring the looper here and to set it up and have it ready for the session so I could make a demo of what, a, what you can do with the looper. I think it's great fun. Thanks again, Mark. Hi, everyone. Okay. I better stick with the word question or I'll be reading comments. Um, question, question. I am a beginner and I know how to memorize notes of a given major or minor scale. I am a beginner and, I, and know how to memorize. Okay. So that's not a question, even though it says question. I'll go on to the next one. Question, I just, this is Paul, I just bought a new Yamaha. Congratulations, Paul. It's a FGTA? I'm not familiar with that model. Or was that supposed to be something else? I know a FG5A. Let me see, mine is a AC5R. Okay, not related. So I don't know that guitar, but uh, congratulations. And I've been playing, oh, any recommendations for strings? I've been using 11s to 52. I think that's a good gauge. Um, I have 10s to 50 something on here, or 10, I start with 10s, that's what I pay attention to. And it's a little light for some things. I like it for finger style, finger style when I'm doing something like this, because it's easy to press down and I don't get tired as fast. But when I'm strumming, it's just a little light, like a little fuller, stronger sound. I think 11s might be a nice, a nice uh, balance there. That's a little heavier than this, but not 12s are, were what I played normally for years and years. 12s are kind of, they call them the uh, light gauge. Interesting acoustic guitar. They go medium light and extra light. There's no heavy. <laughs> I've never seen a heavy. And uh, extra light would be the lightest gauge. Those are 10s. They have in between light and extra light are the 11s. 12s are light extra light is tens, 11s are kind of of a hybrid in between light and extra light. Um, I just strung a new guitar and I put 12s on it. It's a new Taylor. I'm going to try it out. I just brought it home yesterday. I'm going to try it out um, and see how it goes. But I would recommend for brands, to be honest, they're not that much difference in brands of strings. Not as much as they lead you to believe. But I've had great luck with Diderio. They're a big company. I know they, they're very good at getting things right in terms of the gauges and the packaging. Um, the old standby is the uh, Phosphor Bronze Diderio acoustic guitar strings. Phosphor Bronze tends to last longer than, um, what's the other word? That's funny. Uh, brass? Phosphor bronze. Use phosphor bronze. Uh, it's, it's more likely you'd be happy with that. There is a new string they call ec uh, extra long, um, extra life extension. I put those on my new guitar. Um, long extension. L 
X, LX, I think, L longer extension, longer life extension. This, they put some kind of different quality to the metal to make them last longer, not uh, lose their tone as quickly. I'll, I'll let you know. I, I just put them on a guitar and I haven't really, I just got it yesterday, so I haven't really had a chance to try it out, but I'm hopeful. And Diderio has always been good in the past. That said, I got people who swear by Ernie Ball, um, the elixirs, which are slightly coated and they last longer. Um, I've tried all of those and a few other brands. Martin, Martin Foster Bronze, very similar to Dario, Dario, as far as I can tell. Um, I liked them all. They were all fine. Uh, the elixirs, I do think, last longer and they, they have a nice feel on the guitar. They are more expensive by far. And I thought the tone was just a little teeny bit, not as bright. I didn't have a lot of experience with them, so I can't say that definitively. If in doubt, you can't go wrong with the Diderio strings, but I wouldn't. If you got some other strings, I wouldn't throw them away and go get Diderio. I would put them on your guitar, see how you like it. Yeah, it's not likely unless it's some... One thing that does make a difference, by the way, if you have strings for a long time, they do tend to degrade even in the pack. So it helps to use newer, fresher strings. I'm talking within, you know, that you bought in the last two, three months as opposed to a year ago. Um, I prefer to buy a, uh, I try not, I used to buy like uh, 12 strings at a time, but I've been buying like two and three packs at a time so I can keep them fresh longer. Hmm. Knife Man, okay. I'm new to this channel and I'm 50 years old and also confined to a motorized wheelchair and want to learn how to play my new Fender Sonoran Mini as comfortable as possible. I don't know what that is, a Fender Sonoran. I'll assume it's a guitar, but I don't know uh, the model. A mini, is it a small guitar? Um, so, uh, yes, I... I, I'm glad to hear that, and I, um, I think you're going to have a wonderful time. Just be patient with yourself. That's the best advice I can give you, and persistent. Persistent pays off. Think of the rabbit in the hair story where the, the um, rabbit goes out with a bang and peters out, falls asleep, and the hair gets to the finish line. I've seen that play out so many times with learning guitar. A lot of enthusiasm, but peter out quickly. It's the rabbit, I mean, the hare, no, the hare and the tortoise. There, I got it. The tortoise that wins out in this game. Oh, that's nice. I hear, see some people responding to knife, knife Man. Good. Question. Is it a real challenge to change chords on the third beat of a bar and maintain the strumming pattern? Could you just... Could you go to just four down strums? This is Mandy. So, uh, so let me see if I got that right. This is what I'm hearing. Uh, I'm going back to my guitar. Uh, on the, here's the B. One, two, three, four. Uh, let me see what she says. The real challenge to change chords on the third beat. One, two, three, four. No, one, two. So that's the third beat. One, two, three. Um, I find that very easy, actually, because it feels very natural. Uh, the fourth beat would be harder. That would be one, two, three, four. One, two, three, four. Um, harder. Now, I assume you're saying the third beat as opposed to every other, to another measure. One, two, three, four. One, two, three. So yeah, that is easier. Um, but it's very common to change on the third beat. That would be basically two chord changes per bar. One, two, three, four. One, two, three, four. Now, as far as your question is of straight down strums, so she's saying something like this. One, two, three, four. One, two, three, four. 
just straight down as opposed to up and down. I would strongly recommend that. When I'm learning a song and mapping out the chords, I usually go to a, just that straight down just to map out where the chords fit in the song and get a feel in my mind, get the sound in my mind, and also get the feel of where the chords change and how it feels with the, the melody and the, the uh, words. Then I'll start adding a little a, a strum that feels like it's that style of music. Start with getting the chord changes and then just up the ante a little bit if you want. You're fine with just... And some songs I'll never get past that because I decide I don't really want to perfect the song. It'll just give me the sense of how the song feels with the chords. And then, you know, songs I really want to uh, sort of polish up, I'll add a little fancier strum. That's, I would say, uh, Mandy, that's a great strategy whenever you're learning a new song, in, regardless of where the chord changes are. The Yamaha FGTA is a good guitar. It costs 700 bucks. Oh, congratulations, Paul. Sounds great. Ah, yes, 8020s. Uh, bronze strings. Bronze. Thank you, Mark. The 8020s. They are... Brighter at the outstart, it's a metal composition it's talking about, it's guitar strings. They call them 8020 bronze. It's a different metal composition than phosphor bronze. They are brighter when you first put them on the guitar, but they tend to get darker very quickly. Some people like that, and they'll change strings more often. Some people like the dark sound. It depends on the kind of music. For me, the phosphor bronze, and for I find 80, 90% of people just prefer phosphor bronze and the more consistent sound. Thank you. Rodo, let me see, uh, question, any more questions? Ah, yes, Mandy. For example, E minor one bar to C, D, G one bar. Down, down, up, up, down, up. So, uh, I, I think she's, I think what she's written says, here's the chord change, E minor. I'll do the strum first. She's going down, down, up, up, down, up. I call this a pop rock strum. Down, down, up, up, down, down. Because I first came aware of it from the songs from the Eagles. So here we go. E minor. C. So the problem is, on what you're describing is I would change the strum for the C to D. Two, this works for a whole measure, but when you're doing two chords in the measure, you're not going to be able to do that whole strum. So then I would change to just down, down, up, down, down, up, and then back to the full strum. So it sounds like this. Down, down, up. That was great, Mandy, the way you described that. Re very clear. Uh, okay, question, Rogelio. On the B minor finger picking exercise from a little earlier, does it have a name or is it part of a bigger exercise progression? Um, Rogelio, I. I'll, I think you you were talking about this. What I was, uh, what Bauer was asking about. Oh. That is called. Um, it is. It's in the January practice sessions, and it's called riding the bass wave. Uh, let me see. It's um, it's week thirteen, or I'm sorry, lesson thirteen, not week thirteen. Uh, riding the bass wave. That's the the whole exercise song. Sounds like a little tune. Okay, I've answered all the questions I see. If you have some questions in your head, add them now. Um, I'll give it a, just another minute or two and um, check to see if there's any last minute questions and we'll close up. By the way, uh, for those of you who are new to this, normally I do these sessions the first Thursday of every month. I did an extra one this month, uh, but normally you're going to find it on the first Thursday of every month, 12 noon 
Pacific time, of course, it's different Eastern time and uh, UK time, depending on where you live. You can always look on um, the web and see 12 noon Pacific time in California, what that would be in your time. Okay, no last minute questions. I'm going to close up for today. Um, I've got some editing to do, <laughs> a new uh, lesson video. And boy, I've uh, been getting very creative with it. Thank you for joining me. It's been a pleasure. I look forward to seeing you all the first Thursday of February and bring your guitar playing friends and we'll have a party. Bye for now.